So this is the uh, original building that was uh, first operational in 1966. It's, we call it the Silver Lab, and it's named after the first director of the lab. Back in the uh, late 50s, um, early 60s, there was the space race with uh, the U.S. trying to catch up with Russia after Russia launched its uh, first satellite up into space. Um, so in 1957, that's when Sputnik 1 went up. In 1958, the idea for the Space Sciences Laboratory came to uh, some professors here at UC Berkeley. And uh, those professors basically realized that um, there's a lot of different people working on space science related topics. There's biologists seeing if you know humans can survive up there in space and there's physicists uh, figuring out how to build rocket engines to get us up into space. There's just all a whole variety of people working on that and so these professors realized that those people need to communicate with each other in order to uh, advance America's presence in space and that's when they came up with the idea of the Space Sciences Laboratory. Astronomers looking in space will see a, a galaxy with stars and then between the stars they will see gas and dust. We have the opportunity now to look at individual pieces of dust um, very, very carefully using instruments that we can look very, very closely at the materials. I'm Dr. Anna Butterworth. I work here at UC Space Sciences Lab, Berkeley and I'm a planetary scientist. Well, stardust, you can call it interstellar dust, and it is the dust between all the stars. It's made as stars die, and it's recycled and forms, along with the gas between the stars, it forms the, uh, the raw ingredients to make a new generation of stars. NASA's Stardust mission launched a spacecraft with a material called aerogel in it in 1999 and we used that to collect, we hope, some interstellar dust. And aerogel is a very low density silica material and the very, very fast dust comes in like a bullet into a foam and, it's the, and it makes a track into the aerogel and stops dead and then, and then the aerogel and the spacecraft was brought back to Earth and we then go in and dig out the little bits of space rock and analyze them in the lab. So this is the clean room and this is where we actually handle the aerogel that's been to space and back. We look very carefully at the material and make sure that it didn't actually come from the spacecraft. It's not contamination in some way because you could get hit by a little meteor in space and it pings off a bit of the spacecraft and that lands in the aerogel and the, that's brought back to Earth. It makes a track, it looks for all the world like interstellar dust, but it's not, it's just spacecraft. So we use chemical analysis and we can tell that apart. We figured out that they don't come from the spacecraft and they're not contamination. And we're pretty sure they're extraterrestrial pieces of rock. But the next step to actually make those isotope measurements, that's really hard to do and you only get one chance of it because it destroys the sample. Meanwhile, we at Berkeley, we launched a project called Stardust at Home where we've taken microscope images of the aerogel and posted them online on a website and we've enlisted more than 20,000 members of the public to search through the aerogel looking for tracks. And when they find a track, we know where to go and look for these very, very tiny tracks made by interstellar dust and we could go dig them out and analyze them. And to give you an idea of the scale, this interstellar dust is very, very rare in, the, in this collector. And it would be like looking for ants on a football pitch. That's the problem we're up against, and so we've enlisted the public to help us. Stardust at Home project is open to anybody to take part. Uh, the training is on the website, and you can go to the website and get trained up and search with us. It's not just a school project or something, it's actually real science happening that you can take part with in a meaningful way and the results have been fantastic. The science that's done here is related to all sorts of space science. Um, in general, a huge majority of the funding that comes here is from NASA and so we work on NASA missions. We uh, work on a lot of instruments that go up on NASA missions. So we've developed parts that are now on the Hubble Space Telescope up in space. Uh, we've built entire satellites basically. We don't launch them from here, but we do a, a large majority of the construction here. 
Um, we've also just built small parts that we send off to another place that will end up on a NASA satellite. We are running a satellite right now that's looking at high energy uh, X-rays and gamma rays, so studying things like black holes. Uh, we've got satellites that are looking at the Northern Lights and Aurora. Um, just a big variety of NASA-related science. Welcome to the Space Sciences Lab, uh, Berkeley Ground Station. Uh, we're just about to walk down to our uh, antenna. So follow me. So the, um, the antenna is right behind me. Um, it's linked to the, the control room up in the, in the building, in the main building, um, with fiber optic, varied fiber optic cables. The Space Sciences Lab in general was set up at a time about 50 years ago, at a time where the United States as a whole was trying to get into what's historically been called the space race. My name's Sam Johnson, and I work for the, the Multi-Mission Operations Center here at the Space Sciences Laboratory. Most of what I do has to deal with once data is brought down from the satellite missions, keeping it in a place that's accessible to everybody and is always reliable. We use the center and we control missions by checking on the satellites, seeing where they're going, in a lot of cases around the Earth, seeing where they exist in their orbit, seeing what the, all the engineering data on board is telling us about. It's called state of health. The satellite dish that is outside was built actually for one mission called HESI. That mission originally was the real motivating force for that ground station. I was having a conversation with one of our senior members and he told me that because of the orbit that that satellite had, this location of the Earth was very, very good for being able to be communicated with. It would be great if we had a ground station to communicate with it. So that ground station came as a part of the HESI mission. This is a, a very valuable facility to the university and, our, and also the science community. So we, we, have, uh, you know, we have some security measures. We have cameras and fences and it keep out vandals. This antenna was built in 1999 and it's, it uses a lot of old technology. So as, as time goes on, you can't find those parts anymore. So it's really a challenge. Either we have to modify or, or pay more for the parts or or just live with, uh, you know, the decreased functionality. Uh, basically how this works is uh, the antenna uh, provides for two-way communications uh, between the satellite and the ground station up in the main building. There's uh, four different missions. There's uh, Themis, HESI, Artemis, and Cinema. And uh, HESI's been up the, the longest since 1999. Uh, this, actually, this antenna was built for HESI. And HESI studies the sun, the solar wind. And then uh, the, next, the next mission um, that we're tracking is the Themis mission. And originally there were five satellites. Uh, that studies the solar wind, the, nor the cause of the northern lights. And two of those satellites were repurposed into the Artemis mission. So that's the third mission that we're, we're tracking right now. And, um, and the fourth one is Cinema. It's a student project, it's a student uh, CubeSat project. There's a lot of work that's always having to be coordinated. Running even just a single satellite actually takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of people dedicated, not just at um, one moment in time, but many moments in time. Uh, you would think by now we've had satellites flying around the Earth and going off and doing other missions that they sort of have learned how to manage themselves, <laughs> but they haven't. It still requires a whole lot of different people power. Um, when this building was built, we basically, all the people came from down there on main campus. Most of the buildings here in the foreground are uh, Berkeley's main campus. And this is kind of an extension of campus up the hill. 
And uh, we're right up above the Lawrence Hall Science. Some people say the best view in the Bay Area. Uh, the idea of the, this building, the architects wanted to make it an environment where people are more likely to interact. So they left these really awesome views to a big hallway where people walk up and down these hallways instead of like blocking it off and giving a bunch of different offices a really great view. Instead, they bring all the people together. And the idea is to get people interacting and talking. So this is kind of the, uh, the dirty, dark dungeon of the lab. It's the basement. But a lot of what we do, we actually build here in uh, our own machine shop. So there's a big variety of uh, machining tools for building and testing our own instruments. So I'm Jeff Cobb. And I'm a software engineer here at Space Sciences Lab working on the SETI at Home project. Also do data analysis for the project. SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. SETI started many years ago, uh, even before SETI was done at, at UC Berkeley, uh, by people wondering how can we possibly, you know, find ET. SETI at UC Berkeley started about 25, 30 years ago. So you're actually crunching in? Yeah, I'm crunching, but I just can't get the record. So. Is there a, this is the we record as much uh, data from radio telescopes as we can, and um, we're looking for um, radio signatures of advanced civilizations um, elsewhere in our galaxy. The problem with uh, doing SETI that way is that you generate enormous amounts of data. Uh, and to analyze that much data deeply uh, requires a great deal of computing power. And so uh, 14, 15 years ago, somebody else had the great idea of uh, creating a distributed computation to look at this data. Uh, if we don't have the computers to analyze all the data, maybe we can get people interested all over the world to use their computers uh, in, a, in a volunteer fashion to look at our data. So that's the study at home. We have a machine room here at uh, Spain Sciences Lab uh, that have uh, a number of high capacity computers in it that are, is sort of the, uh, the nerve center of SETI at home. And over the years we've um, recorded many terabytes of data and we store the, the data in huge databases. The way we uh, analyze that data is to uh, distribute it to uh, volunteers all over the planet that use their PCs um, to look for their artificial signals. They send the results back to us and then we do some final analysis looking for um, uh, extraterrestrial candidates. And so a lot of people are becoming interested in science and in astronomy and in SETI in particular that uh, maybe would not have even heard of it before SETI at home. So far we have not found ET. Uh, we're still looking. Uh, such a discovery would answer one of the biggest questions that we as humans can ask. We look up at the night sky and we see, you know, thousands, millions of stars and galaxies and it's, it's natural to wonder, are we alone? Or are there other beings out there in our galaxy or, or other galaxies even that are anything like us, that have developed technology that would allow them to communicate with us? Uh, so it's, it's one of the big questions of science and actually I'm very fortunate to be able to be working on that question.